It's a blessing uh, to be here uh, today. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know me, I'm Alex, um, and typically I'm here, I'm the one playing, uh, singing uh, on the guitar, and I got to say, it was just a blessing. What a blessing it was this morning to be among you guys this morning and just hear the worship of God's people, and it was just beautiful. So thank you for uh, the worship team and um, everybody, and, and honestly, for, for lifting up our voices. Uh, we've been in a sermon series called uh, The Minor Prophets, um, and we're going to continue that sermon series today. We're actually going to be reading from the book of Haggai. Um, so uh, if you can open up uh, and turn to your page, uh, open up your books, or uh, Google it if you'd like. <laughs> um, uh, but we will be in the book of Haggai. I encourage you to use the, uh, the table of uh, contents, because it's easy to miss. It's one page. Uh, it's really easy to miss. But uh, if you look it in, um, while you're turning there, I um, want to just give you guys a, a, a brief uh, timeline of where we are as we've been walking through the 12 Minded Prophets series, um, and to kind of give you a backdrop of where our reading takes place today. So we see in our little uh, beautiful timeline here, um, in the very beginning, John, uh, God calls uh, and speaks through his Minded Prophets to Israel. Uh, we see that Israel uh, has been separated and divided as a kingdom. There's Israel and there's Judah. And if we fast forward to about, 520, uh, to about 586 B.C., uh, we see that Babylon um, has come and has conquered uh, Judah. Babylon has come in and they've plundered the land. They've destroyed the temple at this point, and they've actually exiled the Jews. And they were exiled like this for about 50 years. Uh, so Jerusalem, uh, about 50 years go by when God appoints a man named Cyrus. He's the king of Persia. So about after 50 years of exile, this, uh, King Cyrus comes and he conquers Babylon. And God then stirs his spirit and uses Cyrus to release the Jews and to bring them back to Jerusalem and permit them to rebuild the temple that was once destroyed by Babylon. So Jerusalem's been delivered back to their land they begin to rebuild their kingdom, their temple, uh, but very quickly, uh, they come into this new land, and the people in that new land, uh, they give a little bit of opposition, right? Uh, they give a little bit of pushback, and uh, we see that uh, in Ezra 4, 1 through 4. I'll read that for you guys. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel... The people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed the counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of King Cyrus of, uh, of Persia until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So we see that the people have actually rose up and oppressed and, and did everything they can to discourage the building effort, and it works. Jerusalem was discouraged, and they stopped out of fear of the people around them, and they stopped building the temple uh, that they were called to build. And this has gone on for about 20 years now. It's been 20 years since uh, they were permitted to go back to Jerusalem, and the temple has not yet been rebuilt. And this is where we pick up our story from the reading of Haggai today. So uh, before we read, let's pray, and we'll go into our message. Lord God, uh, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for your word. We thank you that from the very, very beginning, we see how you've spoken through the prophets, Lord. You spoke with your voice, with your word to the people, and you called them to repentance. You called them and encouraged them, Lord. And with that, uh, we come, just as we did thousands of years before, we come to your house, Lord, to hear your word. And we recognize, Lord, that though the speakers may change, though the speakers up here uh, may be uh, from another church or doesn't matter, Lord, your word is the same. And this word is yours, and we submit to that authority, Lord. So we just pray, may we hear your voice. Would your spirit speak through me this morning? May I fade into the background, Lord? And would we be, would you awaken in our hearts and awaken our ears, Lord, that we may hear your message this morning? We love you. Praise you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right. So, Haggai, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, 
The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai through the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? So God speaks directly to the hearts of Jerusalem and to the people. He speaks to the religious leaders. He speaks to the governor. He speaks to the high priest. He speaks to the people. And he says, these people say that the time has not yet come for us to rebuild the temple. These people uh, say that the time has not yet come to rebuild the temple. And then he cuts straight to their heart with a question, as God often very much does. He asks a very simple question. Is it time then that you dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? You see, Jerusalem, they've stopped rebuilding the temple. But they haven't stopped rebuilding their homes. For the last 20 years, they've come in, they have their new land, and they've started rebuilding their houses, their streets, their, their, their livestock, their crops. They're rebuilding all of these things, but the temple of the Lord, the thing that they came and they're permitted to rebuild, they haven't touched that since. And we know that the people oppressed them and discouraged them from rebuilding the temple. They made it as difficult as possible for, uh, for that time. We just read that in Ezra. But listen to what God says in verse 2. God says these people, he's talking about the, the Jews, these people say it is not yet time to rebuild. See, they've not only been allowed to be discouraged and dismayed and to stop them from rebuilding the house of their worship. They didn't just allow that, but it's actually gone a, a bit beyond. And now they're saying and using it as a sign from God that it must not be time to build a temple. Oh, the people around us, they're, they're making it really, really hard. God must not want us to rebuild his house. God must be wanting us to do it at a time that is easier. And they've mistaken the world around them as the voice of God. They've mistaken the struggle and their circumstances that it's hard, that it's inconvenient to mean that God must not want them to do this. And if we're honest, I can see myself here. I can see how I can look at the circumstances around me. I can see the world around me and things get a little hard, things get a little difficult. And I can mistake how, oh yeah, I, I over-spiritualize it. Oh, God doesn't want me to do this thing right now. It's not the season. Right? God doesn't want me to serve in his church right now because he wants me to focus on my school and my studies. I say that because, you know, school's starting, right? We all love school. But, oh man, God must not want me to do this thing right now because if he wanted me to do it, he would have made it so easy. That's not always the case. We're called to do what God calls us to do, whether it's easy or hard. As a matter of fact, for those of you in Christians for a little while or for a time, you realize that it actually gets harder to do the things that God's called you to do once you've committed to doing it. They've confused the response of the world and their circumstances around them to be the voice of God. And God clears that right up in the first few verses. We'll continue reading in verse 5. Now, therefore... Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now, therefore, uh, you have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. God calls them to consider their ways. Specifically, take a look at the last 20 years since you've been returned back here. Let's, let's just consider your ways, consider your lifestyle, consider your circumstances. And God gives us a glimpse of those circumstances. He says, you have sown much and harvested little. You see, back in that day, it was very much agrarian, which is just a really fancy $12 word for they were farmers. It was a farming society. 
right? They, they relied heavily on the crops. They relied heavily on, uh, on the work that they did in the field to produce food and fruit, to produce uh, in their livestock their means of life. They, they relied heavily on those things. And for the last 20 years, we see that despite their efforts, they've harvested very, very little. You've sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. They're doing everything of their own strength. They're doing everything of their own power, and it is unsatisfying. Yeah, you eat. Yeah, you drink. But it's unsatisfying. It's not enough. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build, to, and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land, in the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on the ground, what it brings forth on man and beast in all their labors. God lays it out for them. And he calls them to consider their ways, but in case they don't, he goes ahead and he shows them their ways. He calls them to consider the ways, and he mentions how they looked again for much, but it came to little. And then God reveals that it's him, God himself, who's blowing it all away. He's called for a drought on everything, the land, the hills, the grain, the oil, you name it. Why? Because each of them have busied themselves with their own house while the house lies in ruins. They have prioritized themselves, their comforts, their families, their homes, their plans over their worship of God. I want to take a moment right here and just kind of, we hear that word worship a lot. We come and we worship God, and, and what does it mean to worship God? Is it a song? Is it something that we sing? Is it something that we proclaim? Is it just things that we do? And I want to clear it up just to make it a little easier. What, what worship really, really is, is ascribing worth to someone or something. In this case, ascribing worth to God. Worship is ascribing worth-ship. And you can do that a number of ways. Absolutely, it's a song. When we come and we gather together and we sing, we are proclaiming, we're ascribing worth. God, you are worthy of these things. We just sing a beautiful song. Holy, holy, holy are you God Almighty, placing him on the throne. We're ascribing worth to him. We're ascribing him worth when we put aside our pride and we lift up our voices despite the talents and gifts that God may have given us. You know, I, you're worthy of my voice, of my singing. You are worthy of my pride when I set it aside and I lift my hands up to you, God, because I'm just ascribing worth. We also ascribe worth with our time. When we prioritize God's house, when we prioritize God's kingdom, when we prioritize our time with him, the same way how you would ascribe worth to your wife or to your children over your work. You know what? I'm going to take the day off for our anniversary, honey. Why? Because you're worth it. I want to show you with my time that I'm prioritizing you, my wife, over work. We do the same, or we should do the same, with God, with our time. In the morning, what are you ascribing worth to? Are you ascribing worth to how important God's word is to you or by making him the first thing, the first priority of your day? Or is it Starbucks? That's not a call out to you. That's a call out to me. God's talking to me right now on this stage. 
Alex, are you listening? Yes, I am. <laughs> what, how are we ascribing worship? How are we ascribing worth? And this is what they've done. The people in this day, they've sacrificed the worship of their God to prioritize the building of their own house, of their own kingdom, of their own plans. And he calls them, consider your ways. And that same, that same call to consider your ways is given to us this morning. We have an opportunity to consider our ways. Consider how do we worship? How are we giving God his worship? Or are we, where in our lives may we be busying ourselves with our own house? It could be many different things. School, career, Family can be one. Are we busying ourselves with the focus on God and His calling and the worship of Him or our own devices? He calls them, His people, to reprioritize and to build the house of their worship. And he, he just showed you and, and, and told you all the, 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 basically it's a curse that they're living under. He's, he's called them on a drought from all the new wine, from the, from the hills and all these things. But God calls them to reprioritize and build the house. Why? It's not so that God can bless his people again. It's not so that God, God's not saying, build my house so I can take away this drought. Bless my, uh, build my house so that I can... Uh, bless my people again. No, God says in verse uh, uh, 8, go up to the hills, bring wood, and build the house. Why? That I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. We are called not to worship God for hopes of blessing or for hopes of prosperity or so that God can take away our struggles, but rather we are called to glorify God because he's worthy of our worship, because he is to be glorified and he takes pleasure in it. When we worship God, when we prioritize him over our own houses, over our own kingdoms, he is pleased. He is literally blessed by our worship. Think of how, just how when we were praying today, Jacob led us through prayer and he led us through, what are the things to be thankful for? What has God done for us? How is God moving in our lives now? And when we really think about those things to be thankful for, we're really thinking, man, God, how you have blessed us, how you have blessed me. You've delivered me from this thing. You've delivered me from that thing. You've given me abundance and blessing over things that I don't deserve, a grace that I don't deserve. And to a God who is great and to his perfect, how do... How do we bless a God who's blessed us so much? Well, God tells us here, prioritize your worship of me so that I may be pleased in you, so that I may be glorified. In the very least, if you're in, out of response of what God has done for you and who he is, it should call you to worship him. That is our natural response to who God is and to who, what he's done. Continue our reading, uh, verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtal, and Joshua, the son of Jehezadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them. And the people feared the Lord. The people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Notice the change in, in terminology now. God, when he first talked about his people, he said, these people, they're not my people. These people say that it is not yet time to build the house. But now it's already flipped. It's already changed. At the hearing of God's voice, at the hearing of God's calling, they obeyed the Lord. They feared the Lord. Not just the Lord of hosts anymore. They feared the Lord, their God. They re remembered, they recognized, oh God, you are my God. And the response is they recognized they're standing. We have sinned against our God. 
we have not prioritized the things of our God. We have, we have sacrificed the worship of our God for pursuit of our own worldly pleasures. And they recognized, when they sat with that and they recognized their state, their condition before God, it brought them to repentance. It brought them to a fear, a reverence of the Lord to return. You got to remember, God's saying all these things and they're recognizing that the temple is destroyed, no longer with them. They must be thinking, oh, the Lord God is no longer with us. He said all these things to the prophet Haggai. God's no longer with us. But God's response when he sees their, uh, their turning, when he sees their repentance, God doesn't skip a beat. Because in verse 13, then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. This is coming from God. I am with you, declares the Lord. I am with you. If that's you today, where you just sat and you just considered, man, how am I, am I like the, the Jews back in this day? Am I busying with myself in my own house? And you recognize that truth and you're sitting in that and that is you? Know that the moment you turn, the moment you repent the, in honest and truth, God's with you. That's his message. I'm with you. I am with you, says the Lord. In verse 14, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtal, governor of Judah, the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. And on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. So God sees their hearts, they've returned. They repented, they obeyed the Lord, they considered their ways, and they feared the Lord, they revered him. And immediately, it's at that very moment that God says, I am with you. And it's at that very moment that God stirs up the spirits of his people. He then empowers them to do exactly the thing that God was calling them to do. He didn't wait for them to prove it and to start building the temple. That's not what happened. They can't. It's not of their own power, of their own strength. They've been doing that this whole entire time, busying themselves with their own house. Yet the moment that they've sat and they listened and obeyed the word of the Lord and they repented, that was the moment God says, I am with you. And now I will empower you with my spirit to do the very thing I'm calling you to do. That's the message for us today. Whatever it is that God may be calling you to do, whatever it is that God may be speaking to you in your voice right now, convicting you of, I need to change my ways of this thing, I need to repent from this thing. The moment that you come to that point and that realization of, Lord God, I need you, God says, I'm here, I am with you. And then he will empower you with the spirit to do the very thing that he's calling you to do. You're not a doing it of your own strength. You're not alone. God's spirit is with you. We're going to continue reading in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai. So I want you to notice something. Verse 15, it was the sixth month. And chapter 2, verse 1, in the seventh month. So it's been one month. It's been one month since the people of the hearts, their spirits were stirred, and they start rebuilding the temple. They're gathering the wood, and they start placing stone upon stone. God speaks, verse 2, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtal, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? It's kind of interesting. Almost seemingly unprompted, God just speaks and he calls out another challenge and he asks three things. One, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? And is it not as nothing in your eyes? Remember, there was a temple before and it was a great temple. It was Solomon's temple. And that temple was destroyed when Babylon came and conquered and exiled Jerusalem and exiled Judah. And the whole reason why that happened was because of Judah's disobedience. They had already left God. 
And God is directing his questions directly to the elders who were around to witness the previous temple and its, discussion, uh, and its destruction. You see, this is not their first rebuilding attempt either. This is their second rebuilding attempt. 20 years ago, when they were first brought in, they were excited and they began building the temple of the Lord and they actually got down to the foundation and they actually celebrated. In Ezra, we see this, Ezra 3, 11. I'll put the verses on the screen. All the people shouted. This was 20 years earlier. All the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and the heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundations of this house being laid, though many shouted for joy. So that the people could not distinguish the sound of joyful shout from the sound of people's weeping, for the people shouted with great shout, and the sound was heard far away. Ezra catches this moment 20 years before this moment. When they rebuilt the temple, people were discouraged, specifically the elders, the ones who remembered the temple in its former glory. And just to give you a glimpse, the former glory of the temple was great. King Solomon was one among the most richest kings that God's blessed in that day. And just I, in my reading, I just want to give you a couple of facts. Solomon's temple was so massive it required 180,000 men to build that temple. 180,000. And still, it took 17 years to complete. It contained 285 tons of gold, 625 tons of silver, and bronze beyond measure. They literally just they gave up trying to count the bronze. That's how much bronze there was. Here's the thing. The men, as they're rebuilding this temple now, and they see the foundation they realize that there's no way that they can rebuild the temple the way that it was before. They don't have 180,000 men to build it. They don't have the gold. They don't have the silver. They don't have the bronze. They don't have the resources to build anything like the previous temple. And so as they're building it and as they're seeing it, they're crying and they're weeping because they remember the former glory of what they once had that they lost. And they remembered they lost it because of their own disobedience. The younger generation, they don't know. They're shouting for joy. Why? Because they didn't have a temple and now they have a temple. There was no frame of reference for what the previous glory was. They were excited because they're building a temple for God. God's presence was going to be with them and among them again. But as the older men look around, they see the temple that's being built now. It really and truly was is nothing in their eyes. And God spoke to their hearts and saw that. We, they were comparing the past and what God has done with the present and what God is doing. We can take that application for ourselves especially those who are of mature Christians. We've been around for a while. We've seen God do amazing things. We look back and we see God do amazing awakenings here, the Great Awakening in America, the Jesus Revolution. We just saw that uh, movie. God made an amazing, huge movement, right? We don't see those things anymore today, and we're tempted to think, man, those were the good, good old days. We'll never be able to witness or see or do the things that we've done there. It could even be as small in our local church body. Man, when so-and-so was pastor or when this person was our worship leader, man, the, the things that God was doing was great and they are no more. We must not allow the comparison of what God has done in the past discourage or blind us from what God is doing now in our midst. They were discouraged but God speaks to their hearts. And we see that in verse four. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. 
God points them to what God's doing to them now. Yes, remember the former, yeah, I know you remember the temple in its former glory, but don't forget, don't remember, I've made a covenant with you, my people. My spirit is with you now. My spirit is in your midst. Then God takes the people and directs their attention to the future. Verse 5, oh, the very end of, of 5, he says, Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. God gives an amazing promise. God says he will shake the heavens and the earth and will fill this house with glory. He then makes a promise. The latter glory of this house will be even greater than the former. And we can see this. You see, that temple didn't get renovated, and they didn't get any, any additions added to the temple. They didn't miraculously get more gold. or It never really looked like the temple as it was in Solomon's day. But God's speaking about a different temple here. God's speaking about what's going to ultimately be fulfilled in Christ Jesus. You see, the temple is unique in that in that day, it served a different purpose. It wasn't the same as our church here today in, in, in these buildings. It was significant because God's presence literally dwelt inside the temple. There was a little place in there called the Holy of Holies, and this is where God's presence dwelt amongst. We could be among his people. And then the people would come, and they would go, and they would give sacrifices, and God would take pleasure in their sacrifices, and they would go and worship God because that's where his presence was dwelt in. It dwelt in the temple. And here's the thing, God is not with his people, supposedly, because there's no temple, which is what is amazing when God reminds them of the covenant. He says, my spirit is within your midst. Behold, there's no temple yet. But remember, in Egypt, before you built the tabernacle where my presence dwelt, before that, my spirit was in your midst. He was literally a spirit and a pillar of fire, and he would guide the people Just now, the same. He's making that promise. My spirit is still in your midst. But with Christ Jesus, we no longer, God no longer dwells in a building. He never no longer dwells in a tabernacle or in a temple. But thanks to Jesus, he dwells in us. Jesus references this in John 4 when he's alive. He speaks to a woman at the well. In John 4, 19 Um, It says, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped you on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father, but the hour is coming and is here now. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You see, the gospel is this. God created an amazing, perfect world, and he created us in the garden. We were in perfect relationship with him. We didn't need to go to a place. God's presence was with us. We had a perfect relationship with him. We had a perfect relationship with each other. But then sin entered the story and broke everything. It broke our relationship with each other. It broke our relationship with the world. It broke our relationship with God. We could no longer have that connection. We can no longer be in God's presence because God is holy. and Nothing sinful can withstand him. But God, in his grace and in his kindness and his mercy, didn't forsake us, but rather God put on flesh. He condescended into humanity, and he lived among us. He lived and dwelt in us, and he lived a life that you and I were called to live but couldn't 
a life that you and I were called to live but failed at it. But where we failed, Jesus succeeded. And he died a death in our place, a death that we deserve so that we may receive his glory and his prize while he received our death and punishment in our behalf. And with that, God resurrected and defeated sin, conquered death. And in that resurrection, he gave us and poured out his spirit upon us as well. And now we are able to have that dwelling of God's spirit in us. It's no longer, we, we no longer have to go to a place in Jerusalem or, or go and, and find God's in the temple. God's spirit resides in us. Our relationship with God has been restored. Um, Paul writes it this way in Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access to faith into this grace of which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Paul also says this in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, Do you not know that your body is a temple? of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were brought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The Lord dwells in us. Better than God in a temple in our midst, better than God physically with us, is God in us. And we have an opportunity, just as God was calling his people to rebuild their worship, to rebuild the place of their worship, we have the opportunity to consider ourselves and rebuild our worship with a God who dwells in us, empowered by the Spirit to worship him. Every single week, um, we've finished our sermons with uh, a time of reflection where we gather together and we look uh, to one another. We, we find a neighbor and we just share our notes. We share what is God spoken to you with? What are some application points? What, what are you leaving here with today? How did God speak with you? It's also an opportunity to pray for one another. And honestly, it's never long enough. It's never long enough. So we encourage you guys, even after that time, don't let that conversation stop. We don't carve out that time so that it would only be enjoyed at that time. We encourage you after worship, after service, continue those conversations, continue those uh, sharing your, your takeaways. Uh, and before we get into those time of takeaways, I want to just give some application points for you guys. Um, if you're not a believer, if God brought you here today, we, one, we want you to know if, uh, a couple of things. One, you're not here by accident. God is a God who is in control of all things, and he knew you would be here today. He knew you would receive this message, and he has this message for you. And I just want you to understand and know that there is a God who created you, and there's a God who loves you. There's a God who wants relationship with you and is calling you to himself. God wants to dwell in you. And you have an opportunity to respond to that today. And I have a scripture for the screen. This is actually Peter. He just gave an amazing rock star gospel. He just provided the gospel to empowered by the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, 37, and the people respond. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. That's the message for you. If you're here and you're not a believer, I hear and understand there's a God who loves you and desires a relationship with you, sent his son for you. And if you hear this and you're cut to the heart and you want to give your life to Jesus today, find me, find Pastor Jeff, find Pastor Amaudi. And just as Peter said, repent and be baptized. and You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you're a new Christian, if you've started your journey and you're going along, uh, my challenge for you guys and my application for you would be persevere. 
through struggles. Know that God stirred up your heart to build, his, build in your worship of him. But just like in the very beginning when we saw, opposition and struggle came and they allowed it to dissuade them from building their worship and from continuing their worship. I encourage you guys, fight the good fight. Remain steadfast in your word and in your faith because opposition is coming. Struggles will come. Don't let that stop you from your worship. We just read in uh, Romans 5 where Paul says something. Well, he continues. And this is, I want you to hear this as a new, uh, as a new Christian, new in your faith. Uh, not uh, in verse 3. Well, I'll just start from the beginning. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access to the faith, into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But then he continues, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts, to the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. If you're a mature Christian, if you've been around the block for quite a bit, you know, you got a couple of gray hairs and you're wise and you've steeped in the Lord of the Lord. You've seen, you've probably seen God do some amazing things, whether with other churches, whether within the church body here at Generations Church, whether in your own life, maybe you lived and you were a part of that Jesus revolution. I encourage you guys, let us not be so focused on the things that God has done. Let us not get stuck in the days of the good old days of what God's been doing or what God has done. Don't get trapped or don't be blinded and don't miss what God may be doing now, today. In Isaiah chapter 43, God's speaking. He says, remember, not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing and it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, and, to, and give drink to the, my chosen people, the people whom I'm formed for myself, that they may declare my praise. These are my, just a couple of things that I'd like for you to take away. And for parents and for families, how may we rebuild our worship in our own home? How may we build that worship with our children and create that foundation? And for little ones today, if you didn't listen to anything else but listening now, know and, and, and know that what worship really is and truly is is when we provide worth to God. How do we tell God how great he is? How do we show with our actions how much we love God. Maybe have those conversations with your parents today. At this time, I want to give you guys a couple of minutes. We'll say about you know, three minutes or so. Would you find someone next to you, preferably someone you don't know, and share your takeaways as we do that?